130 million years ago, two neutron stars circled around each other, separated by only about 200 miles. They were in the final embrace of a dance that had begun billions of years earlier. The stars gathered speed as they drew closer and closer together, and the force of their dance sent out waves of pure energy that stretched and distorted the surrounding space-time in what we know as gravitational waves. Then, at the moment of collision, the two neutron stars merged and ejected a fireball of gamma rays. 130 million years later, on August 17, 2017, the gravitational waves arrived at the LIGO detectors in the US and the Virgo detector in Italy. While the light from the gamma ray burst was seen by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. It was the historic moment when gravitational wave astronomy and conventional astronomy converged. And the results were spectacular. Daniel Holtz, an astrophysicist at the University of Chicago, said, I can't think of a similar situation in the field of science in my lifetime where a single event provides so many staggering insights about our universe. Today, we're thrilled to announce that scientists have detected gravitational waves coming from the collision of two neutron stars, the smallest and densest stars. This event occurred 130 million light years from Earth in a galaxy far away. We have, for the first time, seen both gravitational waves and light from the collision of two dense dead stars called neutron stars. However, to do it this time, we join forces with thousands of astronomers and many, many observatories. We saw a signal at 8.41 a.m. Eastern Time on August 17th. The signal was much different from the black holes that we had detected before. It was much longer. We analyzed this signal, and what we found was that it was a neutron star, approximately 1.6 solar masses, colliding with a second neutron star, approximately 1.1 solar masses. So this graphic that you're seeing here is just the brief second where they collided. Binary neutron star systems have been predicted for decades, and we knew that we would see them. For me, what makes this event so amazing is what came next, the emission of light across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, revealed to us by a campaign involving 70 observatories, including seven space-based observatories and every continent on the planet. So if you look at the graphic carefully that I'm showing, you'll even see there's a dot in Antarctica. So this is quite dramatic. With multiple detectors, you can put an air box in the sky of where a given source came from. And this works much the way your own ears do. You have a pretty good idea where a given sound came from based on the time of arrival of that signal from uh, some direction. You know, it arrives at one ear sooner than the other. So with gravitational wave detectors about the globe, they will be seen in one detector first, another second, another third. And that time of arrival allows you to triangulate where that object would exist in the sky. And the promise of, of doing that and localizing it in the sky means that we can follow up with other observational instruments, light telescopes, radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays. We were able to identify it quickly. We were able to use Virgo, and Virgo played a very important role in this. Uh, to uh, really get a very, very precise, rel you know, for gravitational waves, that is, location, and then have astronomical partners following it up, and within hours being able to say, we see the electromagnetic counterpart. Right, that's just amazing. LIGO basically told us um, that it should be on this part of the sky, and it was a pretty small part of the sky. And part of the reason we, that happened was because Virgo had happened to just turn on. A month earlier, Virgo wouldn't have been part of this. We would have had a large area of the sky and we might have missed it. What we know is there was this you know, loud ping in the gravitational wave detectors at the same time as there was this burst of gamma rays and this bright thing came up in the optical and is now fading. 
and that's what we know at this point. I'm looking for the brightest explosions in the universe. These are called gamma ray bursts. That's what I really care about. So these are things that you actually get when you have like an entire star that just explodes, right? And it pumps out these gamma rays. And these gamma rays release something like the entire energy output of the sun over its total, you know, 10 billion year lifespan in the matter of a few seconds. And we know these happen. We see them every day at a rate of about once per day. So what we're looking for is to understand them better. You know, what leads to this and what causes them by looking for gravitational waves too. You know, here we are, they happen once a, year, once a day somewhere in the universe, and we don't really understand how, you know, what, what the inner engine is. You know, what's really powering them. They're tremendously bright. We see them to the edge of the universe. Just this burst of light. Where, you know, where is it coming from? And the gravitational waves teach us. The gravitational waves let us, in effect, peer in right to the heart of them. And that's what we're doing. So we've now looked right to the heart of one of these things. And we can tell you, you know, it's definitely these two objects colliding. And that's what caused it. They collided. Two seconds later, there was this burst of gamma rays. So, I mean, that's, that's remarkable that we've had that. We've never had a picture like that before, where we're looking to the very inside of the event. A few hundred times a year, we see a brief flash of gamma rays from a gamma ray burst, a huge explosion in galaxies far away. August 17th started off as a perfectly normal morning for Fermi. We had breakfast. A gamma ray burst was detected, which by itself is not particularly surprising because we see quite a few of them. We saw a brief flash of gamma rays lasting just under two seconds. Half an hour later, we got an email from a colleague at Marshall Space Flight Center who works on both Fermi and LIGO saying, wake up, in an email, which didn't actually wake us up, but OK. Um, this burst has an interesting friend. And a few minutes later, we got a, a formal report from the LIGO and Virgo teams saying that they had detected a gravitational wave signal consistent with merging neutron stars just 1.7 seconds before the gamma ray burst detected by Fermi. Half an hour later, we received another report from a scientist working on Integral, a gamma ray observatory operated by the European Space Agency, who said that they had also seen the gamma ray burst. And with this started the most exciting morning of the nine-year Fermi mission. And the reason that this was so exciting is that there had been a long-held prediction that gamma ray bursts, these enormous explosions, that some of them, the ones that are short in duration, were powered by neutron star mergers. So within the first few minutes of getting this email, we realized that we had actually confirmed this prediction. Now, let me tell you, what we saw were two neutron stars, which are stars that are the weight of the sun, about the weight of the sun, about the size of Manhattan, OK? That means you're dealing with something that's enormously dense. And a teaspoon of it, if you stuck it in, the, in that material, would weigh millions of tons. Astronomers have thought for a long time that the collisions of these neutron stars produce heavy elements. And there's been hints of that uh, in, uh, in other astronomical observations. As these neutron stars come together, you begin to see that it looks like maybe all, maybe not all, but certainly most of the very heavy elements are made in those collisions of two neutron stars. Like, for example, platinum, gold, lead, uranium. They just didn't easily make in stars. And that, people had guessed at that before. But now they really saw that it was two neutron stars. They got that from the, from the gravitational wave research. This is my great-grandfather's uh, gold watch. It's about 100 years old. The gold in this watch was very likely produced in the collision of two neutron stars approximately billions of years ago. We don't know exactly when. So this is really an amazing discovery. Each of those individual discoveries is a big deal. Putting them all together just transforms that discovery. I think there's no doubt at this point this is by far the most studied astronomical event ever in the history of the universe. Uh, you know, well, that's very Earth-centric, certainly in the history of our human civilization. The excitement is all about this wonderful event. You know, it's sort of like, you know, in two years, we're once again changing scientific history.
universe has been expanding since the Big Bang, and the bigger it gets, the faster it expands. The Hubble constant is the quantity that sets the scale for this expansion. And astronomers have been trying to pin down this number for more than 80 years. There are different measurements that are uh, not too far away from each other, but not in comfortable agreement quite yet. What LIGO and Virgo have done uh, using this latest data is uh, to introduce a new method completely independent. This is a method that was first uh, proposed 30 years ago by Professor Bernard Schutz, who's here in the audience with us today. And uh, the idea is to use the signal, the gravitational wave signal from the two neutron stars to measure its distance from Earth. And so now we have a new yardstick, a new standard siren that's going to allow us to measure the expansion of the universe. I've been waiting for a long time to have two neutron stars merging together, accompanied by a burst of gamma rays, so that we knew we could find out exactly where on the sky they are, and we knew that uh, two black two neutron stars like this spiraling together are what we call a standard siren. It means we can measure the distance from the gravitational wave signal alone. If you can measure the distance and exactly the event on the sky. You can also measure how fast away it's moving with a redshift measurement, and that allows you to measure the expansion of the universe. And you're seeing that we're seeing with, with our gravitational wave measurements exactly how fast the universe is expanding at that distance. Bernie's pretty amazing. He's done so much great work, and there was one paper in particular which really you know, left an impression with me, which was this paper where he first proposed doing measurements with gravitational waves and coupling them with electromagnetic measurements, this multi-messenger astronomy, and that it would be a new way to make fundamental measurements in cosmology. You know, the truth is, it seemed like a fantasy. You know, it was one of those papers, it's beautiful, wouldn't that be neat? But, you know, that's never going to happen. Yeah, that was something I did in 1986. So we've been waiting for a long time to be able to apply it. <laughs> At the time, it was a very big thing in astronomy to measure the rate of expansion of the universe. And I realized that we had another tool for, for measuring the Hubble constant. So that was what I wrote in my paper. Here's how to measure distances, and here's how to, how to use it to measure the expansion rate of the universe. Some number of years later, um, I realized, you know, with a number of people that gamma ray bursts would be a very natural way to do this sort of measurement and wrote some papers about it and kind of really started to develop this, how would it work in practice. But to be honest, even when I was writing those papers and giving talks and, um, you know, trying to get community excited, uh, you know, in the back of my mind, I still thought it was a fantasy. Like, this would never happen, or, you know, maybe it'll happen, but it's still a long, long way away. There's so many aspects of this where it really feels like a gift. We had no right to expect, I mean, it's much louder than it needed to be. You know, this gamma ray burst was much closer than it needed to be. It's just this beautiful, you know, sort of emphatic demonstration that, you know, this really exists, and you can do the science you've talked about, and after 30 years, here's this phenomenal confirmation of what Bernie first discussed. It's, it's just remarkable. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do these measurements. So, so it's not that we're suddenly you know, revolutionizing that and coming up with totally different numbers. But it's a completely new way to contribute to that story. And, and that's what's incredibly exciting. And two weeks ago, there was no such thing as gravitational wave cosmology there was barely gravitational wave astrophysics. And now there is an actual gravitational wave cosmology result. It's just, it's remarkable. You know, one moment to the next, I get on an airplane convinced that, you know, things are going fine, you know, it's, you know, but, but there's, there's this major goal of my career, which may or may not happen in my lifetime. And I land and it's essentially, you know, in process, and by the time I went to bed, which was actually the next morning, um, it had all been done. I mean, you know, that it can all change that quickly. It's, it's incredible. I, I just, even now, I can't, I can't believe it's really happening. <laughs> I get kind of emotional. It's really, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, we're lucky. Good time to be alive. <laughs>